Welcome to Joint Effort with Des Moines Orthopedic Surgeons. This podcast covers the pain and injuries that are associated with muscles, ligaments, and joints. Hi, I'm Baron Bremner, and today on Joint Effort, we have Dr. Shane Cook, who is an upper extremity specialist in Des Moines Orthopedic Surgeons. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Tell me about your background in your training, your orthopedic training. Yeah, so I uh, attended undergrad um, at University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, from there, I tried uh, several other careers, but ended up uh, going into medicine and got my prereqs at University of Colorado at Denver. Then I did med school at University of Colorado, trained at University of Iowa. That's how we ended up here in Des Moines. And then did a fellowship in upper extremity in Charlotte, North Carolina at Ortho Carolina. What do, uh, so what is that fellowship known for? Um, you know, I know it's all upper extremity, but is it a certain type of surgeries that they're known for? Yeah, so, you know, I think they, they cover from the shoulder distal, so so that's uh, their specialty. They do a lot of nerve work, um, a lot of amputation work, um, uh, and just uh, a lot of breadth of trauma, um, arthroplasty, and uh, a lot of uh, nerve type surgery. So arthroplasty meaning replacement of different joints in the hand and yeah, yeah, elbow? Yeah, yes, exactly. Um, and you you do some shoulder and elbow surgery in addition to hand surgery, correct? Yeah, mainly I, I did shoulder early on. I've kind of focused my uh, practice from, you know, kind of the, the mid-humerus distal. So I do some elbow and wrist mainly. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of guys in our group who do shoulder that are very good at it. Great. So I, Great. I, I went to that. And where did you grow up then? So I grew up at, right outside of Denver, uh, oh, okay. Colorado, right in Littleton Lakewood area. Okay. I uh, grew up out there and lived most of my life out there and uh, ended up... And then you went to Boulder? Then we went to Boulder. Yeah, what do you think of that town to go to school in? Oh, Boulder's a great, great city. You know, it's uh, the Flatirons. It, it, it's one of the most beautiful um, yeah. campuses, you know, known and uh, had a great time there. But it, time goes fast. And yeah, what's that? You what's that? Uh, little there's a place at the base of the Flatirons, like a, um, an inn or something like that. Uh, there's yeah. a lot of oh, a lot okay. of inns All out right. there, but <laughs> my, I've I brought my daughter out there to take a look at it too to see she's a freshman in high school, so I brought her out there to see if she wants me to go to school out there. You know, a lot yeah, it's a great place. Active lifestyle out yeah, there, right? Yeah, very active. Yeah, ski resorts not far away. And, yeah, you know, and a lot of a lot of good things. And your wife is from? She's from. Um, also, we actually went to high school together. Oh, so okay. She's from the little okay. Lakewood area, also. Okay. Um, so, and I think when you talked about other careers, one of them was football, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, for those of you listening, uh, Shane's a big guy. We went through this kind of weird phase in Des Moines Orthopedics where we wouldn't hire anybody for like two years that was under six foot six or something like that. So we, we got you, Barely and, made you and Brunkhorst and uh, Isaacs, and we got all these giants that we hired. Yes. Um, so you played at, uh, your, is it the Buffaloes? Yeah, University yeah. of Colorado. And then what did you do after that? So I played um, University of Colorado uh, until about the year 2000. And then after that, I tried to pursue a professional career. So I went to NFL Europe, went over there. I actually got my only championship um, oh. in my career there with the Berlin Thunder. Came back. Uh, tore, I tore my ACL. Had to get ACL reconstruction before I went there. Came back. And then I signed with the Saints and had a kind of career-ending injury with them. Oh, really? So, yeah, I, I tried. I was one of the guys trying to live the dream. And, you know, I made it to that level. But it's a challenging level and a lot of competition. And, and had yeah. to refocus my, my attention. Sprechen Sie Deutsch from uh, living in I don't know Berlin? say a little bit, but a little bit. <laughs> ein, ein bisschen. That's how you say that in German. Okay, very good. But... Uh, so then, um, what made you gravitate towards hand? You know, we do a lot of, I mean, you're, you would think a big guy swinging a giant hammer, you know, in orthopedics. Uh, how did you get in, interested in the anatomy or the pathology of hand? Yeah, I like the, the variety of hand. You know, I think there's a, there's a lot you can do. Um, some of the cases are faster than others. Um, some take more detail and more time oriented. And I like the I like the change up and, and the pace of a, a clinic visit and uh, the surgery of it. Um, you know, I thought about sports for a while. I thought about joints, but uh, in the end of it, I, I like the the variation in the anatomy and the uh, fine details. Of yeah, hand. you know, my, I do a little bit of hand, just like mm-hmm. you know, carpal tunnels and things that people that come to me for. They're not seeking out a hand surgeon, but I do carpal tunnels and trigger fingers and stuff. Yeah. You know, my favorite thing about hand is. <laughs> That I get to sit down for a second. It is good. Because you know, I'm always just standing and pounding things away and sawing. I just get to sit down, put on some nice music, and yeah, take care of a little it. hand. Yeah. I, uh, that's maybe one of the reasons in residency I was always standing for this case, is, but I was the tallest one in the room. So, so the I was tables, always, tables I was always down bending knees, over. So right. I said, well, you know, right. that, I'll just sit down for cases, and well, it's worked out well. <laughs> one, once you're the boss, you get to set the height of the table. So it's, uh, you know, in residency, it's not very much fun. Taking full advantage. Yeah. Of well, um, what are your favorite type of surgeries nowadays? Yeah, so, you know, over the last two years, I've started to implement something in my practice called a de where 
Um, you know, everybody's heard of a joint replacement when your joint wears out and you get osteoarthritis, sure. as you know, of the knee and hip. You, you, uh, the big, uh, you know, surgery is a knee and hip replacement. They do very well, great orthopedic surgeries. In the hand, we have some challenging joints that are smaller, and there's other uh, uh, things you can do besides just going to a replacement. Mm -hmm. So one of them I've gotten into is a de-innervation where I, I take actually the nerves that just go into the joint that send the signals back to the brain of pain, and I... I go in there and I de-innervate the joint. And so I've started that over the last year. So that's been a, a positive part of my practice mm -hmm. that I've, I've really um, uh, expanded on and, and enjoy. So it's um, probably not as much morbidity, meaning like damage to the structures because you're just taking out the nerves that feel things in the joint. Nothing to do with the sensation nerves to the skin or the motor nerves to the fingers, anything like that. Yeah, exactly right. So I, I tell patients that all the nerves that give filling and function to the hand and the wrist and and your fine intrinsic movement, we don't disturb those. What we do cut is the nerves that come off of those that dive straight, straight into the joint. And those are the nerves that give uh, give the brain a sense of pain and osteoarthritis. And pain is what usually drives patients to come to clinic to talk to us, is that it's interfering with daily uh, living and that's bothersome to them. And so this surgery is one you can do before going to a bigger thing such as an arthroplasty sure. and whatnot. And, uh, you know, it's it's in the literature and it's written out and I went to a course in it and I really enjoyed it and I found it to be a, a very positive part of my practice. And if for some reason the patient has continuing pain, there's still that option to do an arthroplasty sure. or whatnot. Is there any role for, like, um, doing an injection around the nerve you're targeting to see, kind of tell the patient this is what it's going to be like, you know? Do you ever do it like a pre-surgical injection? Yeah, good question. Around the nerve? Yeah, I think it's the same as, you know, doing an injection in the near hip. You're not kind of targeting nerves, but you're mm -hmm. targeting the joint itself, trying to decrease inflammation. And when you put the numbing medicine, that's part mm -hmm. of the corticosteroid injection, usually people get pain relief right off the bat, and that's mm -hmm. that numbing medicine, numbing the nerves around the joint. That can give them relief. So usually I tell them if they get good relief from an injection, there's a good chance that they'll get relief from this mm -hmm. denervation. I imagine, I know they've tried some of these denervation things in other joints like the hip and things back mm -hmm. before they had replacements and they didn't work that well. But um, are these named nerves that, you know, this is the so-and-so descending branch of the blah, or is this just an area that you know you need to take care of, or are there actually discrete nerves that you're looking for? Yeah, they, they're articular branches from a named nerve. So, for example, when I do um, the metacarpal phalangeal joint, which is just the knuckle joint right there, mm -hmm. I, get, I cut the nerves from the dorsal sensory branches, and then I go on the front side, and there's two digital nerves that give filling to the end of the finger, and there's little nerves that come off of that that dive straight into the joint. So they're articular branches from the digital, Got common it. digital nerves, Got and it. there's one from the ulnar nerve that comes up also. But so. there are predictable nerves that you find and take care of each time. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, what uh, What's the difference, like, um, as far as the utility for that for wear and tear arthritis versus, like, a rheumatoid or inflammatory arthritis? Can you use them for both types of arthritis in the hand? You can. One one time I'll shy away from it if, if it's an unstable joint. Um, you know, if there if there's a ligamentous injury or a very unstable joint, I'll I'll discuss different options. You know, such as fusion or doing things like that. So, like but, really crooked fingers and and rheumatoid arthritis and stuff that might yeah, make you shy away from that. Yeah, but even then, I think there's still a place for it. I think every patient's different, and mm -hmm. pains are main complaint, and their functions okay. I think mm -hmm. I think there's a role for it in that. But it, you know, it, it would be something um, you know in a patient that had a you know a ligamentous injury or something like that that. Um, that maybe that's why they're causing pain to go in and create stability rather than just getting sure. rid of the pain feedback right. would, be, would right. be a reason maybe not to do it. So we're talking about the, uh, the wrist joint and even in the intercarpal joints, the small bones in the wrist too? That yeah, and I kind of lump those together. I okay. think the nerves that innervate the, you know, there's the uh, radiocarpal joint, there's the midcarpal joint, and there's lots of joints within the wrist. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think the main nerves that innervate them are, are kind of encompassing of all gotcha. those. From the standpoint of other joints that I do, um, is the the knuckle joints here, the PIP joints. You can do the DIP joint. I've done a few there. And those are those are the main joints. So the little finger do. joints yeah. too. Um, what if that doesn't work? Then what's your next steps? Uh, what are the other options for finger or wrist arthritis? Yeah. So if they fail, um, you know, conservative treatment, and they fail the uh, deinnervation, they have continuing pain. Um, it just depends on the why they're having that pain and if it's um, a joint that could be replaced if they're a candidate for it or sometimes fusion can be the best option and fusion what that is is we bring bones together that usually rub and cause pain that are missing that cartilage as a knee and hip replacement 
and sometimes you can just bring those bones together, give them to heal as one bone, and patients do well with that, and that uh, creates uh, pain relief, you know. But there, there's some sacrifices to it, such as, you know, some loss of wrist range of motion, things like that. So but most time, people are very happy if they're in pain. That, that so with the fusion, you're trading a little bit of motion, possibly, depending on what joint you're talking about, to get rid of the pain. Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, which joints in the hand and wrist, maybe not even in your practice, but in hand which joints in the hand and wrist are amenable to, like a replacement of some kind? Yes, yeah, so I think all the joints are. And I think, uh, you know, it's not as common as knee and hip replacement, mm -hmm. you know, and shoulder mm -hmm. replacement. Um, but all the joints are amenable to a replacement. The most known one is probably the thumb, so the thumb CMC replacement. It's a little different than what you would do in hip and knee, where you put, you know, a socket and a ball and, you know, and there's, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. there's metal and, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, different types of material that you use. This one, you actually take a bone out and fill it in with a tendon from the uh, local tissue, and, and people do well with that, so that's a way. There's also wrist replacements and knuckle joint replacements that you can do where it is what, you know, the knee right. and hip, what people right. would experience there. So, um, I remember in residency, uh, Bill Cooney and um, Peter Amadio and stuff that taught me, they were doing, like, pyrocarbon implants in the fingers mm -hmm. and then like celastic or plastic yeah, yeah. implants in the fingers. Is that something that's still done commonly? I think it was mostly for rheumatoid arthritis back then. but Yeah, I wouldn't say commonly. It, you know, it's not as a successful a surgery as a knee and hip replacement. They're mm -hmm. tried and true, well studied, you know, you, you kind of know the course of it. Um, but they're, they, they are done. And there's thing is also, you know, knee and hip, you have two knees, you have two hips. Uh, from a hand standpoint, I mean, you have, you know, 10 different joints, you know, within just the PIP joints, you have eight of those, you have the thumb IP joints, you have the DIP joints, you have the MP joints, so there's a lot more joints, so you got to kind of pick and choose your battles and yeah. what you're doing, and there's a lot of force through the fingers, too, that's not, you know, as linear as maybe a knee knee replacement, hip replacement, it's more right. more of a pinch, so, so you know, there's a, there's a, is a higher uh, rate of, of failure and uh, complications with them, but yeah. in the right patient, they can be a great surgery. Um. Yeah, the thumb has an incredible amount of force at the base of the thumb, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Like just from, you imagine, like I think it's if there's one pound of pressure at the tip of the thumb when you're pinching it, isn't there like 10 pounds? or? Yeah, it's multiplied by 17 about, pounds yeah, or something. 10 to the, 20 pounds. Yeah, yeah through the, through and the that's the why that joint wears out so much. You, you, that's probably a great deal of your practice seeing people with basal or thumb arthritis, isn't it? Or do you see Yeah, it that? is. Yeah, that's probably the, that and DIP joints. So DIP joints is, uh, is the most common. Yeah. But this is a complex joint too. It's a saddle joint, so it just doesn't work as a hinge joint or a ball right. and socket. Right, it's not just like a knee up and down and or a ball and socket. It's got a lot of different motions to it. Yeah, and so that can cause issues. But I've seen some patients that have horrible arthritis on x-ray and have, have had no pain their whole life too. So there's a, there's a spread of that. But that is definitely um, a joint that we see commonly and and there's a great surgery for it that does well in the right patient that's bothered Is that by what you're talking patient. about with uh, taking the ligament and, and uh, suspending it mm -hmm. underneath there? So you, you excise all or part of the bone that's rubbing on it and then put a ligament in there instead of a metal or plastic piece, right? Yeah, yep, exactly. Um, you know, you, you alluded to this a little bit, but people will come in, into my practice even, and like it might be an afterthought, they say, well, what do you think about this knuckle? You know, and they're pointing to the knuckle mm -hmm. just, just proximal to the fingernail or the other one, and they're like, bulgy in all the fingers and like my mom looked like this I don't want to look like this what is that and you know is there any genetic predisposition to that and do they need to be treated if you know if it's not painful yeah no I, I always tell patients I say you know that I'm not a cardiac surgeon where if we don't do some kind of a heart procedure on you you may have a you know a life altering event with um, orthopedics the nice thing about our field is it's it's pain and function is probably the two main reasons we do most of the surgeries that we do if you have pain and your function is limiting we have the surgeries that can help you out so people who come into my practice and complain about um, pain at this joint or they just say hey it's knobby my mom was like this I'm worried it's going to advance what's going to happen I said well there's a chance that it becomes painful but right now if it's not painful or bothersome you know there's no surgery that's going to make it look better than it is mm -hmm. you know that's that that it's mainly the pain and function part of it if you're doing okay with that um, we'll continue to watch it if you have pain then we can try different modalities of conservative treatment mm -hmm. and then there's obviously surgeries that can address those issues also is that right that it's uh, more common in like uh, scandinavian heritage uh, do you you know caucasian females to have those knuckles that are knobby like that and the Heberdens and Bucard's nose, do you remember that at all or not? Really? Yeah, no, I, I think it is. Um, they're the ones who present the most, but I've seen a lot of heavy laborers, you know, both male and female sure. that come in and they just have hands that have been through, you know, a lot of a yeah. lot of wear and tear over the years that'll get the same thing. But, but yeah, I think maybe there's a higher propensity to it. With that being said, I think it presents in both um, 
males and males and females and that that's a difference too as you run into osteoarthritis versus rheumatoid arthritis what's the differentiation and you know what's wear and tear versus your body actually starting to attack it yeah from that that's something that you know comes up frequently in hand where i say well this doesn't look like the typical wear and tear right it looks like something some other process is going on and that's when we get our rheumatologic colleagues involved and say what's you know what's going on order some labs and it's, see yeah. if they have something else. so if somebody's got some swelling that kind of is typical for rheumatoid arthritis you might send them to get some lab work Mm -hmm. and uh, ask them a lot of questions about you know other joints and then you might send them to a rheumatologist and because that's the type of thing where unlike a lot of things we see with wear and tear it's just like you know go ahead and do it put up with it it's not gonna i'm not gonna intervene and stop this from getting worse rheumatoid arthritis they can stop it sometimes or at least slow it down medically right so that it doesn't damage the joints further yeah exactly so with the the rheumatoid medication it's been a game changer for i think hand surgeons and all orthopedic surgeons in general what used to be crippling and um, just horrible disease and uh, deformity of the hands and fingers and other joints now is relatively well controlled if they um, get a, a disease modifying um, anti rheumatologic yeah. uh, yeah. drug uh, they're called DMARDs and so that's always the first line treatment is control the underlying process of why you're having these issues right. and, and the room our, our uh, room, rheumatologist can do a great job seeking that out I agree one of the things I worry about and I'm sure you do too is um, when they are on those disease modifying medicines that they can be at higher risk for infection when we do things like joint replacements mm -hmm. and other things so it does kind of throw a wrench in the works there it's a great great um, group of medicines but there are some side effects with it that can be concerning too yeah um, speaking of other things that are kind of game changers do you think that the uh, so there's a contraction of the fingers that I think it runs in families, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Dupatrins. Yeah. And so some of the fingers can start to curl up and it can become so limiting that people can't open their hand, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, can you tell us a little bit about that and what options are are there for that? Yeah, so great question. So, you know, I, I think first is figuring out what is going on. So a lot of people come in with the trigger finger, but somebody will tell them, oh, you have Dupatrin. So they say, oh, I have this thing called Dupatrin. You say, no, it's a trigger finger. So figuring out what the underlying cause is, they can actually present kind of in similar ways with the flex finger. Yeah, a trigger finger could be an injection or simple surgery typically yeah. to fix that. Yeah, exactly. And Dupatrin's usually, it's familial, it runs in families. Um, it's usually, you know, Scandinavian, Northern, mm -hmm. um, uh, European descent. Um, uh, and you see it mostly it's it's kind of males in their 70s who you think of but females can get it and um, other other uh, 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 Caucasians uh, African Americans all those are susceptible to it and I've seen them in all um, some some uh, what it is it's uh, thickening of the fascia in the hand and it actually causes the fingers to get contracted down and people feel these nodules these nodules and these we call them pretendinous cords in their hand where the cords actually, you can fill them and it'll pull the fingers down. They can pull different joints down in the hand. It usually affects a small ring, but it can affect any any um, digit in the hand. Uh, and there's good options for it. The thing is, if you let them go too long, I've seen some people where their fingers are completely down here. The issue is the skin becomes shortened and then it makes it really, really difficult to, to get function of that hand back. So it's better to catch it early and do a treatment early. And there's a couple things that, that we can do for it. If it's not symptomatic and they have relatively small contractures, you can just watch it and see how it does. If it goes on to uh, progress, there's different things you can do. And we can even do an in-clinic procedure where I just take a, a little needle, it's called the needle apronotomy, and I just cut the cords um, with the patient awake and, mm -hmm. and manipulate it and get it straight. And that, that works well. Some people with more advanced need more advanced surgeries, and there's different surgeries for that. For that in-clinic thing, is it something where you'd have to do a few sessions of it to kind of get a full release or do you try and do it all in one session no it's usually all in one session okay um, it's pretty well tolerated people do well they have to be awake for it because you're cutting that cord and there's nerves around it so you don't you know yeah. you, you want to be able to communicate with them and ask them if they're feeling any numbness in their fingers and whatnot yeah um, so it's a it's a great surgery for the right patient but yeah. like I said people who let it go too long that surgery is not going to work and you need more advanced surgery and sometimes if it gets really really advanced it's really difficult to to recover from what's the role for like an enzymatic treatment for something like that with a collagenase or injections into the cords of some chemical that can help dissolve it yeah so the brand name for that that probably most people's heard of is Zyaflex and it's a collagenase and what that is is it's a it's an enzyme that you inject in the cords and come back two to three days later and you manipulate it um, it's similar to the the needle apneurotomy where you're just breaking up cords in certain spots um, I don't perform it personally mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, 
after you do the uh, treatment on it. If you ever have to go in, if they reoccur and you have to go in and do surgery, there's a lot of scar tissue there and that can make it a little bit more difficult to find the nerves and trace them out. So, mm. so I've kind of went to the needle laparotomy and, and the open procedure. Got and it. there's some called the digit widget that I'll use also, but um, but that's, also, that's, a, that's a good option. It's been well studied. What's the digit widget? Is that like a... Uh Stretching device? Yeah, it's just something for people with contractures of the PIP joint. It, it takes time. It takes about six weeks, and you pull it out. Oh, line. okay. All right. Those can be pretty difficult Got to it. correct, actually. Uh, there's some associated um, thickenings of the fascia with that, right, that people can have in other anatomic locations? They can, yeah. Yeah, the, the two is one is of the penis. It's called peronies, and the other one's the bottom of the foot. It's they can get a contracture in the foot, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, so what you know in addition to that stuff that we talked about those are all it's really interesting and so much detail and you know um, anatomy in hand surgery and in hand pathology it's amazing and i admire you guys for doing that it's just uh very delicate stuff Thank but you. exciting and delicate yeah. um in addition to those things that we talked about what about uh just in the last few minutes that we have things like uh, tendonitis around the wrist um can you tell them our listeners a little bit about what uh, decrevain's tenosynovitis is, and then also intersection syndrome, which I've seen a couple times and is pretty interesting. Yeah, so they're two different pathologies. Decrevain's is much more common. And the typical thing you hear in med school is, is, you know, if you have a toddler in the house or a new baby and the parents are picking it up like this and they get this pain on the radial side of the wrist and it hurts with any time you ulnarly deviate. So what it's it, on the thumb side of the wrist. It is on the thumb yeah. side of the wrist. And people confuse it with arthritis of the wrist. What is it? But it's more, it's higher up and it's in this area. And they'll get swel swelling, tenderness, you know, to any touch. And it hurts when you pull your wrist down like that. And people say it's severe pain. Um, that's, that responds very well to anti-inflammatories and injections. Um, if that doesn't take care of it and you have continuing issues, there's a surgery for it that you can just release the tunnel. Um, intersection syndrome is a different uh, pathology. It's much more rare. Um, usually the typical uh, thing that we study is people that row a lot or do a lot of repetitive pulling motions. And it's higher up and it's actually where the um, extensor tendon from the first dorsal compartment, which is the quare veins in this one, mm -hmm. crosses the second one, and there's a place here in the wrist about right here where it crosses over, and you can get some inflammation there that can cause pain. Mm -hmm. And that usually responds well to an injection, rest, um, anti-inflammatories, and um, if they have continuing pain and fail all those, you can do a de debridement of the area. Got it. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, hopefully we can do it again soon. Um, you give us a lot of great information to think about. Good. Well, I appreciate you having me. I think this is a great way to get our get um, educate patients and, and give them good options. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening to Joint Effort, a podcast from Des Moines Orthopedic Surgeons. If you have questions about this podcast and wish to schedule an appointment with the surgeon, call 515 515- 224-1414 or visit dmos.com.